Hey, everybody. Welcome to Tim's Vinyl Confessions. I'm Tim Durling. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, we've got John the Music Nut here once again. John, thank you for continuing to help me deep dive into Y&T. Thank you, Tim. It's been a pleasure. Love it. Uh, we, we have been working our way through the catalog. We've got one more studio album to go, uh, but we uh, were taking a bit of a pit stop in 2003 and 2004 because in those years um two very very unique releases came out from yc the first of which is this unearthed volume one and down at the bottom it says demos and unreleased recordings from 1974 through 2003 that's the cd itself looks like an old ampex reel of tape right uh, there's the back cover <laughs> with the uh, treasure chest opened now mm -hmm. this album came out or that yeah this this came out um i think late 2003 and it was kind of serendipitous because i had just gotten a computer and i had just joined the ynt fan forum online and uh it used to be a very very active forum there uh i did an interview with jeff Keir, who was the webmaster for ynt it's uh, in this book down for the count the ynt album review and he talks about what a community it was and, you know, how much fun we had. And, you know, it was one of my first destinations online was to, you know, it just, I have, I wonder if there's any Y&T fans out there. And I stumbled upon the forum. And um, if anybody's watching this that is curious, my username was Canuck. That's what I called myself because I was one of, one of the only Canadians on there. Right. You know? um, and a lot of folks were talking about the song titles and quoting song lyrics that I had no recollection of. And I was like, what's, what's going on? So I looked around, I looked on the web store and I saw that they had, you know, essentially a, a new release um, of, of uh, previously unheard material. And I, I, I said, well, I got to get this and I got it. And it was very much like getting a new y &T album. I mean, most of the songs, I had never heard before. There's a few that are in slightly different form or Correct. parts were taken and put into more recognizable songs. Um, and uh, the lighter notes, thankfully, are very, very uh, in-depth. So it says we, where each of these songs come from, what time period, who played on them. So I'm just going to do these track by track. Um, shout it out. Now, this has a copyright of 1988 on it. So um, it's Phil says it was written for 10. An earlier version was called Why Fall in Love, written for Contagious. And it sounds very much like it. And like a lot of the songs, it's just a trio of Dave, Phil, and Jimmy. Um, I think this is a fantastic opening track. And right away, I'm like, how did this not make an album? I feel the same way. Now, I don't have, I never bought the hard copy the hard disk of these. So I'm listening to these songs and I'm putting in how I feel about them without knowing that any of that information. To me, this would have sounded great on Mean Streak. It's got that great melodic rock, the nice bridge into the solo. It's, it's a strong track. It should have made an album. I have a lot of, I have all the songs listed here and I have asterisks next to the ones I think that should be on albums. And that one, I think, should. And then there's a lot here. I'm like, why? <laughs> you know, like, yeah, this yeah. one I think should be on. But then there's some, I mean, I'm like dumbfounded. Yeah. How it, these some of these did not go on in place of some of the others that did. Yeah, this is this is not a collection of throwaway material. The, these are really, really strong tracks. And so right away, it's, it's off to a good start. The next track is one. I knew the title from reading about it. I knew this song existed. Wild If I Wanted. This was actually a song that John Nyman uh, mostly wrote. But this this song dates back. Listening to this, it sounds like it could have been on Down for an Account. It's got a similar sound. And it, it was actually featured, I believe, for 38 seconds in the movie Out of Bounds with, I think, Anthony Michael Hall, which was one of those uh, Rat Pack movies. Right. And it wasn't a very successful one. But the funny thing is, John, about that movie, there are so many bands I like that have songs affiliated with this little-known movie from the 80s. So Y&T had this song. It was not on the soundtrack. There was a soundtrack released okay. on IRS records. This song was not on there. So I don't know 
how that ended up happening. It was never a B side or anything, but it was a fully recorded song. Um, Night Ranger have a song in there called Wild and Innocent Youth, which is not a great song. It's OK. okay. It's, it's about as awkward as the song title sounds. It's OK. Um, the Motley Crue song, Nona, from Girls, 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 was supposed to be a full song. As people know, that's just a really brief instrumental. Right. But in the, in the remaster, in the 90s, the, uh, or, um, the late 90s remasters of all the Motley Crue albums, Nikki Six says it was supposed to be written for this movie, Out of Bounds. Okay. And not to be outdone, Bon Jovi have a song called Out of Bounds, which was written for this movie around the time of Slippery When Wet. It's on their box set, like 10 million Bon Jovi fans can't be wrong. Oh, okay. It sounds very much like it came from that era. So there you go. And of all of those Night Rangers, the only band that's actually on that soundtrack. But um, this is a great, great YT rocker. I mean, if John wrote most of this song again, that further cements why he was perfect for the band. Absolutely. Um, to me, this is red hot and ready before red hot and ready and stronger than that song. Yes. John Nyman wrote this many years, wrote this with the band many years before he was in Y and T. If you're a fan, if you if you're a YNT fan, you've never heard Unearthed. Listen to this song and tell yeah, us. Yeah, this is the classic lineup too. By the way, Joey and Leonard are on this. Like this mm -hmm. is from 1985-86. This this should have been on Down for the Count instead of uh, Don't Tell Me What to Wear. You know, oh my like god, this, this would have killed most of the songs on Down for yeah. the Count. I mean, this would be excellent, one of the standout tracks. Vintage YNT. Absolutely fantastic. Like, check this. Check out this collection if you never have because. A lot of songs, particularly on volume one, you're like, why? How is yeah. this not put out? I mean, you you could take the best tracks here and make a very strong YNT album that you can rank easily in the middle of their catalog. Yes, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah, it wouldn't take the place of any of your top ones, but it's just no. really good and really strong. Yes, uh, Next up is Standing in the Fire. This has an 88 copyright date on it. It was written by Dave, Phil, and Taylor Rhodes. Taylor Rhodes features mm -hmm. heavily on uh, Contagious Intent to an extent. Yes. Catchy. This is a catchy rocker. Nice long solo during the fade out. Great chorus on it. Yes. Again, this would have been a great AOR track. Uh, yeah. Particularly on 10. Uh, yeah. there's Because 10, I like that album a lot. There's a few songs that don't grab me the way others do and i can easily put stand in the fire in places i'm gonna uh, and, and there's a lot of ballad of like the songs on 10 too which i'm sure was record company pressure now that's my yes. favorite one album i couldn't imagine it any other way right but if standing in the fire had been on it and stay let's let's pick on let it out yeah okay it would have been a more up-tempo album where i would have um, went <laughs> and yes. some of dave's ad-libs on these songs from this period like he was really reaching that next level of voice you know Crazy, crazy the stuff somebody's doing absolutely and the thing about these is most of these songs are recorded well yeah they don't play like demos most nope. of the time there's yeah. a few there's a few and, and they say the ones that were transferred off of cassette and they said right. we got more of these but we we were we didn't tear you know this was all we could do but yeah. um, um oh the next track <laughs> in the name of love um listen to me this is a top 10 single. This is not a throwaway. This is a top. This could have been a big, big hit. It was co-written by Dave Manichetti and Taylor Rhodes. It's it's got a it's got hooks galore. It's sort of white snake-ish. Um, huge chorus, huge like lighters in the air chorus. It's like a mid-tempo ballad. Awesome, awesome song. And once I once this hit, I'm like, okay, who's Who's pulling my leg here? Like this should have been, this should have been on Contagious or 10 and it could have been the lead single. It could have been a huge hit. Like this is excellent, excellent song or someone like another band could have recorded the song and had a hit with it. It's yes. just it's got a hit written all over it at, for the time period. So yeah, this yes. was one of the big question marks. Like, why, why didn't, why, how could a record label hear this and not see money? Not to sound cynical, but you know what I mean? Like, this has this has yeah. the potential to reach a wide audience. It does. The chorus in there, you can hear 
like pop singers singing this and having hits with it. Yeah. Easy. And yes, it, it does remind you of is this love in the beginning. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. But it, you think it's going to stay in that vein until it goes in that chorus. And you're like, holy shit. Right. The chorus takes such a turn chord wise. And I love how mm -hmm. the bridge takes you there. That's really good songwriting. It is. You know, it's, it's like, and it just, and it, and it just, when that chorus hits, it's just bam. Yeah. That's, you know, so we're off to the races now. <laughs> yeah. Um, so next up, we, <laughs> next up, we get some material that was recorded in 1994. So this is pretty cool. So it's just Dave, Phil, and Jimmy. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> in, in some way, it is one of my favorite songs on here because it always puts a smile on my face. It's called Dirty Love. And this is absolutely a jam that was captured on tape. What do you think of this? <laughs> a jam caught on tape and dirty love is that's appropriate. That's an appropriate title. What a loo yeah. you got some loot ass lyrics in there. Yeah. Um yeah. it it's it's cool. You got a nice riff at the end of the chorus. Phil, um Phil and Jimmy sound great on this. They all do. I mean, again, the three piece. Yeah, but by the time they got to this point, they were such as a rhythm section. They were just locked in, and then all three of them on the jigga 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 jigga. Yeah. So let me tell you what 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 Phil says about oh Phil and Jimmy says about this song. Phil says this is the demo. Having not written a second verse, we sang the same one twice. It didn't matter. The song is all about the energy. So Jimmy said, um title always cracked me up when we didn't have lyrics dave would just make up words as we played through song ideas when we got to the break before the chorus he just goes dirty love we were all cracking up because it sounded so ridiculous he kept going with these off the cuff lyrics which are really funny the only way to make the whole thing sound funnier was to play double bass drums in the chorus the whole thing was mm -hmm. sort of a joke and then some somebody outside of the band heard it and says wow that's really happening we all shook our heads but it's it's it is true. Like, yeah, he's he's got the double bass drums going in the chorus, mm -hmm. and knowing that you, it just you could just picture the three of them just grinning at each other playing this. Um, yeah, and that's not to say that it's a throwaway song. It's a heavy, heavy song. It's catchy. Mm -hmm. uh, it's got a nice bridge. It's got a it's yes. got a typical Y and T bridge. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, it, it's a it's another great song. Now, would this have replaced anything on an album? I don't I don't know. Uh, as far as no, being I raunchy, I don't think it's as raunchy as, as Cold Day in Hell, and it might have occupied that spot on Musically Incorrect. <laughs> but but it, but as in, you know, I'm just glad we got to hear it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and there was some definite experimenting going on in, in for those 94 sessions, as mm -hmm. the next track illustrates play by play. What do you think of this one? Well, this again shows that YNC could play anything. Yeah. Here we go, funk. Yep. Funk rock. This works like a charm. And here, you only need one guitar. Yeah. You 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 put in another guitar here, it sounds too busy. Yep. This works, plays like a charm. Again, the counter bass lines from Phil on here are killer. Wonderful. What a groove laid down. What a fit right in on those 90s albums. Um, yeah, it's it's a diff it's a different, it's a change of pace, sir. Yeah. Um, because they never did anything like this. But you listen to it, and you're like, "Yep, another thing to add to the palette." I wish they, I wish they put this out. Oh God, on and a you regular, know, regular album. The, the riff to the song is this jangly, like that could be Nile Rodgers playing. Yep, mm -hmm. that's right. But the song, this has always reminded me that it reminds me of the Jackson song "Enjoy Yourself." Oh, there you go. Yes. Uh, dance, 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 dance. Like, mm -hmm. um, so, uh, yeah. So this could be the one Y and T song you could try moonwalking to. Um, but yeah, it's uh, Phil says in it, you know, growing up in the Bay area, you had slime, the family stone and yep. you had the tower of power horn section. So they said that we went a different way, but that stuff was always very, very important to us. So they kind of, I like the fact that they, they were, and it sounds still sounds like Y and T it's still Dave. Um, it's just really good. It's really good. Mm -hmm. uh, next one is kind of funny. Short arms. Uh, 
this one dates back to, I think this is one where they recorded it several times, but this song, um, who was actually on this? Okay, so this is the this is the classic band. This is from 86. This has got Joey and Leonard on it with John Nyman and Bill Costa on background vocals. It's not meant to be taken seriously. It was written for Contagious, and this song was written about their manager at the time, Scott Bure, who was known as the King of Cheap. <laughs> he's got short arms and deep pockets um yeah it, it's a fun song what do you think of this one it's got this acdc def leopard feel to it um yeah yeah it again just sort of fit in like a chart this is better than a lot of songs on contagious and that's an album i like a lot but yeah. it's so catchy yeah um the harmonies are great on it nice chorus yeah this would have fit right in on Contagious, in my opinion. And it it's it's catchier than a lot of the songs on Contagious, in my opinion. It Another is a great AOR you, track here. Yep, you can latch on to that chorus immediately. Um, mm -hmm. next one is kind of kind of different. Uh fast track. This one dates to 88. Dave Phil and Jimmy wrote this. What do you think of this one? Okay, we're going more into the funk here, but it's slower. Yep. Um it their mid tempo song, yeah, nice solo, nice chorus. I don't like this as much as play by play, but again, you know, it's shown that they can do funk if they want to. It's yeah, cool tune. Yeah. Uh, next one, another one like in the name of love. I think really should have made an album. Is love gone wrong? Yep. Fits on the nineties albums easy. Swings like swing something fierce. Yeah. Nice swing feel on here. Guitar lines are great. There's a nice breakdown in here too. Um, uh, I and I wrote sounds a lot like something. A lot of the songs that would be on Contagious and yeah. just as strong as most of those tracks. And there's you know there's a couple you could probably take off and put this in and fit in great. This song was written by Jimmy DeGrasso, Al Petrelli, and Dave. So and yeah, Al Petrelli. Nice. You know, I, which makes me wonder if somebody else didn't record it. But I mean, it could have been a hit for somebody. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it, you know, this is one of those ones that, you know, a lot of these would have made great album tracks or some good, good rock radio tracks. This Definitely. one could have been a hit. I almost get, um, I'm not sure who it reminds me of, but it sounds like something I could hear on the radio. It's, it's, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's very commercial. Next one, uh, next one's called 16 Tons. Take it away, John. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I find it interesting. They're doing a song called 16 Tons. It sounds like ZZ Top. And ZZ Top have been playing Marty Robbins 16 Tons in their live show for a long time. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Yeah, that's what oh, I was okay. thinking. Because first of all, is this Marty Robbins? Yeah. And um, <laughs> and I'm listening to him like, no, it's not Marty Robbins, but it sounds like ZZ Top. It's well played, nice chorus. I don't think this is one of the stronger tracks on the album but that was the first thing it's i, I just saw that lyrically, lyrically it's in bar and boogie territory mm -hmm. and Very it much. even ends it even ends a little bit like uh lagrange <laughs> it does yeah now the funny thing about this phil said this song had been kicking around the yt camp for years at least before down for the count but this version here is from 89 so it's it's uh, got dave phil and jimmy on it um okay. Which I don't know how well this would have fit it up, fit on ten, but it's just interesting that it was one of those songs they didn't want to give up on. Right. Um, one of the oldest, but not the oldest track on here is "I Make Believe." This one dates back to 1982. I wrote it sounds older, but more like I I thought it sounded late seventies. Um, it would have been one of the stronger tracks on maybe "Struck Down" or "Yesterday and Today." There is a nice bridge on it. I don't know if it would have fit in so well on those 80s albums, though. So. But 70s. The drums just... to me sound exactly like Black Tiger. Like okay. the drum, you know, it's got that sound. But um, but uh, it was written for Black Tiger, but they never finished it or finalized a melody. Phil wrote new lyrics in 2003, and Dave sang it. So musically, it's got Dave, Phil, Joey, and Leonard on it from mm -hmm. 82. Okay. But that's a new vocal from Dave on it. Okay. So that's the story of that one. Mm -hmm. um, next one, a song title that will sound familiar to many, Hard Times. Blueprint 2, yeah. Hard open Times. Track from 10. Open up Similar 10. but different. 
-hmm. more of a ballad. It's yeah, it's more of a ballad. It you, the the version on ten smokes it. Yeah, I mean it's different. Um, it, it's a lot slower. Um, the lyrics are most of them are the same. It changed yeah. it up a little bit for the version on ten. Um, it's interesting to hear it, but again, it it plays like a blueprint, like a demo. Yeah, I like the fact that they put some of these on here where you can hear how um, where how something started and then compare it to how it ended up. Because mm. yeah, um, you know, there's no comparing with that. That's that's one of their most powerful tracks on an album. Um, oh, yeah, it's, this is nice, but it's not. You know, it, it, they definitely polished and polished and polished and made a really, really good song on it instead of just an OK song. Mm -hmm. uh, next up, this is another one of the trio songs. This goes back to 87, Driver. Um, I don't think much of this. It, it It's driving and it and the solo destroys, but the song is OK. That's yeah. as far as I could go with that. <laughs> uh, Dave says, Phil seems to have had the only copy of this on cassette and it's complete with hiss and dropouts. Mm -hmm. So they they stuck it on here. Next one is another song that dates back to 82, Give Me Rock. Yep. This sounds like it was written for Earthshaker, Black Tiger. Nice creative lyric. This chorus is a little cachet. Um, but you know, with that gimme rock, that gimme rock chorus there. Um, and it's it would sound like a lesser track on one of those albums. I could see why it didn't make the final cut. Originally called All the Way, which I can kind of hear. All the way. Mm -hmm. done, done. Mm -hmm. Bill says he was inspired by the, to write the lyrics to the song when they played Sweden Rock in 2003, which I believe we've talked about. That was when they were really returning to playing a lot of live shows. So he was right. really inspired to just rock, write a song about rock and roll. Um, so yeah, it's got new lyrics from, from Dave. And uh, the rest of this, it's the original, it's the original band playing, which is cool. It's cool to hear remnants of that time. Uh, mm -hmm. Next one is called Shakedown, just a Dave and Phil song, totally written as a, as a sort of an ACDC homage, which you can hear. It reminds me a little bit. She's too tough. Yeah. Um, it, yeah, again, short, short, effective chorus, nice riff. Sounds like didn't make, you know. It was written for Earth Shaker, didn't quite make the cut. You know, it's it's decent for what it is, but I mean, Earth Shaker is a killer album. It's, yeah, yeah. You know, so it's not going to replace anything on there. Uh, the next one is another one of my favorites, Trigger Happy. This has a good chorus. I like the riffs on this because the riffs really sing on this one. There's yeah. a nice solo at the end. You got a nice bridge on here, too. Yeah, this I like. I don't, I put this as, I gave this an asterisk to something I would put on a studio yep. album. It's definitely of his time, the whole bang, bang thing, but. Yep, that's true. <laughs> you know, hey, why not? Um, yeah. I think it's catchy. I think, I think it could have got radio play. Mm -hmm. Apparently, this is the song where Dave says, I remember tracking the vocal to this in my spare room studio on a hot summer night. The window was open and all the neighbors within 100 yards could hear me screaming. Luckily, they never seem to mind all the strange sounds coming from my house. Right. So, I read that. And finally, finally, you must have really uh, rolled, <laughs> rolled your eyes at this one. Last track in this album dates all the way back to 1974. Rockazoid Rolleroid. Now, the backstory behind this song is that they, there was a band that was performing at the time called Zoller X. They were sort of like space themed and they addressed each other in character and these guys thought that might be kind of fun to write a song like that um i hear a little space oddity in it um, mm -hmm. but <laughs> but what do you think of this song <laughs> it's not ymt at all no Who, who's that alex harvey on vocals i mean the i think it's leonard there. i think it's oh. actually leonard Okay. Yeah. <laughs> all right. We knew we'd all be dead. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, yeah. Um, the production. You know, some of the seventies albums are have those timeless productions, and some yeah, of yeah. them are best left in the seventies. That would be this. Yeah. This um, was a demo. This was ne this was never finished. <laughs> yeah. This was never finished, and you could see why. It, it's yeah. just 
It's just them goofing around. Yeah, yeah. it's a no, it's a novelty, but it's fun. But it's a novelty, and I yeah. that's why they put it on at the end. Um, but all in all, I mean, it's a strong collection. Like the seventeen tracks on here, you could make a really good ten track album out of this that could have come out in 88 89 91 like it could have come out right in right in that time period right i agree uh, and you wouldn't have to do anything there's singles they, there's there's three songs on here that could have been singles so yeah I agree i'm glad that. they put this out so that's volume one uh the very next year they came up with volume two similar album cover different color scheme this one only ranges from 74 to 89 and I will say this. I think there's some strong tracks on here, but you can tell why there was not a volume three. I think they were running out yep. of they were running out of material. But I'm still glad they put this out right down to the, the CD that itself looks the same. So um, first track on um, the difference is here. A lot of the songs on here came from I didn't know about this, but apparently the producer for 10 was going to be Ronnie Montrose. Mm. So a lot of the songs on here were produced by Ronnie and co-written by Ronnie. So the first track face to face is one of those songs. What did you think of this one? Could have easily fit in on Kate contagious or 10 joyous track. Great riff, killer solo, great chorus. You can easily hear this on AOR. Um, excellent. Again, why we're not going to say why so much on this album, on this collection rather, but yeah. This could have easily been on 10 or contagious yeah. the great Strong song. track and mm -hmm. and i'd put it right where it is the opening track yeah it's a i great agree with that too. i agree uh, next one is ashes to ashes this is one that phil and ronnie wrote demo from january 1989 <sighs> again scorcher great chorus memorable riff the solo and a band with a guitar player who has so many great solos. And I gotta ask you, Tim, do you know if Ronnie's playing some of the solos on this? Uh, he's not credited. Okay. He's not, he's not credited. It's just uh, Dave, Joey, Phil, and Jimmy credited. Solo here is wonderful. And nice breakdown after the solo, too. Yeah. Yeah. Again, what could have been <laughs> a great yeah, track. Uh, next up is Get Tough. This one dates back to 88. Okay, this again sounds very contagious, but I don't think it's that strong. It sounds a little like L.A. Rocks, which we'll get into later. Yeah. Which songs it sound like L.A. Rocks. Um, uh, played well. The chorus isn't the chorus isn't good at all, in my opinion. Um, I could see why this didn't make the cut. Yeah, wasn't just not. Jimmy not did write quite, it though too. Yeah, not quite there. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Um. Next one is uh, Showdown. This is one that Dave and Ronnie wrote. Very spirited. Cool. Has a feel like Shake Me Loose or Shake It Loose yeah, from, yeah. from Art Shaker. This I like quite a bit. This this yeah. would this would work as a this would work on an album, no question to me. This is one of the five strongest songs of this collection. Or maybe yeah. six. Yeah. Uh, for the record, and people that were on the forum will remember this, this was the preview track that we got about a month before this came out. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> next up, Love Has No Cure. This one goes back to 1986. Uh, great wordplay in the verses, but the choruses sound really choppy. It, they just don't work. Although lyrically, it's fine. I think it just needed... It may have been, it could have been something if they tightened it up and worked on it a little more. I hear a little bit of where they borrowed from a bridge part of this song and put it in face like an angel. Okay. Yeah, I hear yeah. a little bit of that. But I like yes. what Leonard says about this, because this is the original band. Leonard says, new Simmons kit number four. Ugh, must too fine noise can use on now, says Caveman. <laughs> Got real catchy electronic clapping sounds, don't you think? <laughs> they thought so too. What's up with that? So yeah, it, it's it's got it had potential, but um, yeah, I, I I can see why it's you know didn't quite make it. Although I like yeah. the fact that there's different lineups on these Unearthed albums. It's true. Yes. Yeah. Um, next one. Next one goes back to 1978. It's called "Help Me Hear Me." Okay, so. I read the all music review for Unearthed Volume Two, 
And it says that this is a dead ringer for Gypsy from Deep Purple's album Stormbreaker. And they weren't wrong. <laughs> it, it sounds just First like First thing that. Bill says, written in the late 70s after hearing Gypsy by Deep, Deep Purple. I loved it so much, I sort of ripped it off. Yep, <laughs> that's what it is. And I didn't know that song at the time. But I, you know, I hear the help me, help me, hear me, mm. tell me, Gypsy, can you see me? Yeah, it's very, very similar. This one mm -hmm. is... Um, but it, this is more of a ballad. It it's is. Great guitar playing. Um, I can't hear this being on either of those first two albums. No, no. I couldn't either. I agree I with that. I think they have done this live, though. Like, at, when this came out, I think they have done it live, which is kind of an odd choice. But still, you know, it's cool that, uh, that they did. You said you could hear this on one of the first two, or you couldn't? I couldn't. No, I, I, yeah. I, I, okay, I don't know why I they would have slotted something like this in. Okay, yeah, that I'm I'm thinking the same thing. This isn't yeah. them at that point. No. No. So yeah, Phil's the first to admit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's I really like Gypsy, so I wanted to <laughs> write, write something like that. But mm -hmm. he says, what did he say here? Don't judge me too hard. No. Let's see. Uh, I kind of ripped off the lyrics from a handout in psychology class. It was one of those poems by Anonymous. Don't judge me too harshly. Most songwriters who rip off say it was inspired by. Right. <laughs> exactly. Um, <laughs> right. Next one's interesting. New Kid in Town, which is solely written by Ronnie Montrose. This is another Montrose production. And this actually made one of his own albums. I've never heard his version of it. But what do you think of Neither this one? Um, yeah, this reps. Um, what a chug and riff on here. You got the color yeah. provided with the on the second guitar. Um, yeah, this... This could have definitely been on an album. I, I like this one a lot. Yeah. Verses are very strong on it, too. Yeah. And, and the verses end with those chugging riffs. Yeah. Really it's, nice. it's pretty it's pretty cool to, yeah. Uh, next up, Long Time Coming. This dates back to 1988, and this is another one that was written, Dave, Phil, and Ronnie Montrose. Uh, I'm sure you heard some familiar sounds here. It sounds like Cold Day in Hell and Delivery. Yeah, it's Cold Day in um, Hell's verse. Yep, <laughs> it's just not yeah. as raunchy. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's what I heard. Yep. I actually kind of prefer this one. Mm. But, uh, oh, <laughs> contrarian. Just, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe just because I'm so used to Cold Day in Hell. Yeah, this is another one that dates to January 1989. Mm. Uh, next one, another one that's uh, even more so is, is familiar. <laughs> dance, dance, dance. L.A. Rocks. L.A. Rocks. Yeah. With, With a, a different, different chorus that doesn't chorus. work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but this actually has Leonard on it. This was yeah. one of Leonard's last recording sessions before he left. And the drums on here are a little busier. Yeah. Than they were on what Jimmy that did way. on Contagious. And that is why, because it's Leonard. Mm-hmm. And uh, but Phil, Phil says, at, over the years, the band had an aversion to certain words dance being one of them so he changed it to boys night out only to have the record company call at the 11th hour to say we had to change the title to sammy hagar on the same label had a song coming out on his new record with the same name i always thought if we had left it dance 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 it would have been played in every strip bar from here to bangkok now that would have been a success <laughs> mm. okay but uh, but yeah it's la rocks i mean it's even it's LA rocks with Leonard on drums. I like that. It's like that crossing the two, you know, eras. It's like when to me, that's kind of like when you hear um like the demos of say Def Leppard's Animal, where you have Rick Allen playing drums when he had two arms. It's it's that oh, kind of, okay. it's that kind of duality. Hmm. Um next up, odd song title, Crazy Make Love. This one, uh, this one dates back to 86, and it's the original four on it. The verses, it's slow and easy by White Snake. Yeah. Dun, 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 dun. That's yeah. That, that's slow and easy. Um, chorus doesn't work. The good solo from Dave, the acapella part after the solo is pretty cool. But outside of that, it really doesn't do anything for me. The title, Phil says he got the title from his wife, who English was not her first language. Oh, okay. Um, and Leonard says, uh, let's see, we were all really into this tune. Then White Snake had a huge hit with Slow and Easy right about the time we were demoing this song. End of story. Mm -hmm. So 
yeah, undeniable similarities. Yes. Um, the next one is over under. Cool drum fills by Jimmy. This is another Ronnie Montrose's co-written this one again. Guitars yeah. work well. Uh, driving verses lyrically not really up to snuff. Um, it, it's it's decent. I can see why it didn't make an album. Yeah, already you can see that it's not as strong a collection as Volume One, but I'm still really glad that they put it out. Correct. Yeah. Next up is Hands of Time. Acoustic version of the grand dramatic closer that's on Down for the Count. I like it better on Down for the Count. I like how they made it so dramatic. Yeah. But it's nice to hear this in its blueprint as an acoustic song. Well, okay. this is actually from 92 or 91 or 92. Yeah, summer 92. This okay, was my bad. Yeah. No, I mean, th th this, um, I had heard of this. This was done for a KOME compilation CD, like a radio station. And I think it was for, it was for a compilation record to fight AIDS. Um, so the, this is, uh, so it's got Dave and Phil and Jimmy, and that's actually Jill Menachetti on the background vocals. So yeah, this was like their unplugged version of, of okay. this. So I knew that they had done that, but I'm glad they put it on here because I didn't have any way of hearing it any other way. Mm -hmm. uh, next up is Bad Bad Girls. This is from 1988. Very musically incorrect, meaning that album. It sounds yeah. like it probably could have fit in on there, even though lyrically it's not as dark yeah. as a lot of the songs on there, but musically it would work. Um, you know, it's it's okay. Um, again, yeah. you could see, but glad it's out yeah. on this collection, but you can see why it wasn't on one of their main yeah albums. sometimes you can it sounds just like that so it's like a first batch of songs that they would come up with and they would start mm -hmm. and they'd get better and better next one's another old one this goes back to 74 now it's it's nowhere near like uh rockazoid roller it's called take me well this is a heck of a lot better in fact this reminds me a lot of fog hat from the time from fog yeah. Hat's music from that time uh yep. this kicks um this would have this would have would have fit in on one of those later out i mean it would have been one of the superior tracks on one of those first two albums, in my yeah. opinion. Um, it, it's nice counter bass lines, great groove. It's again, it just so fog at and fog and their prime were killer. Yeah, I mean, they, they've made a lot of albums, but those 70s albums were a sweet spot, and I think this would fit right in. So this song was actually it was written in 74, it was actually recorded in 83. Okay. That's the background on that. Okay. Uh, next up is the uh Interestingly titled "More." Uh, playing, uh, oh, playing's impressive. Lyrically, it sounds like Wasp, <laughs> doesn't it? Like early, like early Wasp. I'll, I'll listen to that again. Yeah, early Wasp before Blackie went more political and then became Christian. Um, yeah. yeah, it's yeah, very graphic lyrically. It sounds yeah. like something that beyond the last command. <laughs> um. Phil says, I really like this song, but the chorus, well, need I say more? Right. It's a little, unfin it's a little unfinished. Mm -hmm. And Dave says, a good intense rocker that barely made it to this CD as the tape was dropping out all over the place. Mm. Okay. Um, next up is a song solely penned by Joey Alves, Lucky Night. Uh, it's decent. I can see why I didn't make the album. It's you know, just yeah, it's okay. I I'm not. I don't think too too much of it. It's a, you could sound like it's something that that just wasn't strong enough to be on an album. Yeah. How about you? About the same. Okay. About the same. Uh, next one, "Love Don't Come Easy," written by Jimmy, Phil, and Dave. They play a bit of this. Um, a bit of this can be heard on the documentary on the show. Dave's screaming a lot on this one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, pre chorus, pre chorus is cool. I don't, again, I could see why it didn't make an album, but, uh, you know, it's a little more interesting than the last couple songs we hit. It's all right. Yeah. The last two tracks in here were recorded in a parking garage. So if you wonder why the drums sound the way they do, yeah. 
it's very it's a very harsh sound um mm -hmm. but uh yeah um it's okay like i can I, I can you know the chorus gets in your head but yeah it's um you know uh nothing I, nothing that would have replaced anything on 10 certainly which is right what for. and then finally cheap and easy joe phil and dave on this one again from the garage sessions literally you ever listen to Savoy Brown? That's what uh, you know. I don't like. think I ever have. I've heard. I've heard a lot of people talk about them. Oh, if you listen to their great late sixties, early seventies albums, this sounds a lot like that. Um, because the guitar playing. I mean, Dave sounds like Kim Simmons, who was their leader, and he yep. was there until he died a couple of years ago. Um, songs fine. There's a nice slide playing on there. I listen to this. I I think of Tell Mama by um savoy brown savoy brown and then the guys from just a little musical history lesson here uh three of the guys would leave savoy brown and then form fog hat fog hat right and yes. then they were they had more of a boogie sound where yeah where um savoy brown stayed in that blues rock vein most of their career they did take a few detours here and there but yeah when you go see them live they play this great blues rock from um those great early 70s albums like street corner talking and stuff like that but that's this i like i mean it, it sounds very savoy brown but I, again they could do anything you know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? so there you go that ends that ends the unearth series um and um i had asked jeff here it's in the book i had asked him if there was plans to do number three and he says there absolutely was they didn't think they could fill a cd so which tells me that there's probably more than enough material to fill a CD, but was it any good? So right, I never um, thought. You know, I uh, but what it, it was interesting because I mean these came out before the remasters, so they were obviously holding on to things like "I'm Not Sorry" and "Somebody for Me," the songs that ended up as the bonus tracks. But you know, it's fast to me. It's a fascinating look at what might have been. It had you know. Uh, different producers work on an album I, yeah the idea of ronnie montrose producing them seems to me would have been a a slam dunk but i guess they brought you know mike stone had the name and uh you know they weren't taking any chances with 10 the, the right. label it. But there you go that that's a good look back um not the easiest cds to find now i think one of the editions is still available on their website ytrocks.com but don't sleep on these if you can get them these to my knowledge, these were never ever in stores, John. I think these were only ever exclusive to the, you know, so what you're going to get now are, are used copies, but worth seeking right. out because there's lots of great material, especially on that first one. But both of them have their moments. So the Unearth Volume 1 series, not exactly albums, not exactly best ofs because it was largely unknown material. So I thought it best to talk about it here. So next up, we're going to talk about, so far, I hope this changes the most recent YT album. John, thanks for sitting in with me once again. Thank you, Tim. I appreciate it. All right, everybody. Thanks for watching this edition of Tim's Vinyl Confessions.